performance and efficiency. All right. So you think about the basic things you need in your home. You can start with security. Right? Most of us in our homes, we employ people called security guards. But let me ask you, do you really trust your security guard? No. And you shouldn't trust them if you are investing so much into your property. And that's how come we have things like the ring doorbell, which most of you may have heard of. Now, the beautiful thing about this technology is the fact that you can monitor it from wherever you are. And later on, I'll talk about how it's developing, where it's not just a camera that you see movement around your house, but wherever you are, you can, for example, play an alarm from your phone to just ward off the intruder. So that's where technology is taking us. In the same way, most of us want to conserve energy at home. Because electricity ain't cheap in Ghana. So what is happening now is you go to some homes and the lighting system uses sensors. So when people are not in a room for a number of seconds, the lights go off. As soon as you go back into the room, the lights come back on. These are just little things I'm hearing. But I'm going to show you another video. The, most of you may be familiar with the Amazon Echo. And that's where a lot of people start from. Um, the point is not working. Sorry. All right. So, I mean, let me just explain this. So, smart homes, essentially, is leveraging technology like the internet, AI, or uh, artificial intelligence, and other technologies to operate and enhance the experience we get from appliances, whether it's like a door, bell, or security system, or even lighting, or even sometimes appliances like a Hoover. Well, there are smart hoovers as well, where it will man maneuver around and that do the hoovering for you. So that's where things are headed now. Now, one of them, for most people, the entry level is what we call the Amazon Echo. So this video, for example, will show you some of the things that people are doing with just the Amazon Echo. Sound, please. <laughs> Echo is a device designed around your voice. Simply say Alexa and ask a question or give a command. Alexa, how many tablespoons are in three-fourths cup? Three-fourths cups is 12 tablespoons. Echo is connected to Alexa, a cloud-based voice service, so it can help out with all sorts of useful information right when you need it. it to me, it's you know bringing uh, technology from Iron Man at Tony Stark's house into your own. Echo can hear you from anywhere in the room, so it's always ready to help. I can have the water running, I can be cooking, the TV can be on in the back room, and she still can hear me. It can create shopping lists. Alexa, add waffles to my shopping list. Provide news. From NPR News in Washington. Control lights. Alexa, turn on the lights. We use it to set timers. We use that feature all the time, and that's one that's specifically helpful, I think, uniquely to blind people. Calendars. Today at 1 p.m., there's lunch with Madeline. And much more. Alexa, how's traffic? For Jose's commute, the fastest route takes about 18 minutes. You can even reorder from your Amazon shopping history by simply asking Alexa. The Prime reordering is when you can ask Alexa to order something that you've already ordered through your Prime account. Stream music from Pandora, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, and Prime Music. We use music a lot. And listen to your favorite audiobooks from Audible. In the years since I first started reading Artie's Missives. With its advanced audio design, Echo fills any room with immersive sound. And she's kind of funny. Alexa, tell me a joke. Why did the bubblegum cross the road? Because it was stuck to the chicken's foot. The Echo app is useful for keeping track of to-do lists and other info on your device. What's great is that, for example, if I want to read exactly what's on my to-do list that I added through the Echo, I can also access it even if I'm not at home. Echo is always learning new skills. We actually discovered that we can teach Alexa to learn my accent. Alexa, add Nescafe on my shopping list. 
I have added Nescafe to your shopping list. And becoming part of the family. Alexa, what's the chance of rain? There's an 80% chance of rain. The Echo is a tool that we use to keep our household functioning. Okay, boot and boat. Ready to go? Yeah. Alexa, goodbye. 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 So these are some of the possibilities, and this is not new, right? This is not new. But the point I want to make with this is that just a simple tool, just a simple technology manages so much in the home. And that's the potential that we have to do that. And it, it's, it's about efficiency. The other beautiful thing about Alexa, for example, and a lot of these tools is that they are AI, I mean, um, Integrated. What it means is that it learns from your behavior, it learns from the things you do, and it's able to predict or suggest things for you. Right? So, for example, I love eating jollof. Okay? So, after a couple of weeks, I can ask, what should I eat on Sunday? It can tell me, well, you love eating jollof on Sundays. So, why don't you try jollof? Or why don't you try something new? Because it's learning from my behavior. And that's the beautiful thing about it. I want to make the point again that People are investing a lot in their homes. And we need to make it possible for them to enjoy the experience in their homes. What it means is that for us as realtors and as developers, we need to lay the connectivity and everything that we need, they need to be able to just move in and plug in these things. My experience is that, unfortunately, some of us are backward, if it's all right to say that. I've moved into homes where when you move in, even just to get DSTV, you need to do some drilling. We've moved way beyond that. So we need to think of the convenience and the needs of our buyers as we develop the property. So right from the drawing stage, right from the planning stage, we need to have these things in mind. Are we good? All right. So, well, somebody might tell you, well, but that's out there. It's not in Ghana. I've got news for you. This slide is from Ghana. So... 132.5 thousand, homes have smart appliances. So it's not new, it's here. It's the degree to which what type of appliance we're using. And these are different appliances. So the value of that market alone in 2022 is $23.22 million. That's not a lot. But it's still decent money. People are investing in these appliances and these tools and this technology. We look at other things, like for example, when you break them down, for just appliances like washing machines, smart fridges, smart TVs, that's how much we're spending, 4.48 million. And it breaks down all these things. The biggest, I think, is in the home control devices and stuff. And then also in security, there, 5.03 million. So a lot of us are investing in these things. Now, even when we're investing these things, especially in security, we're only investing in the cameras. But where we are headed, like I'll tell you very soon, is where you do not only see the video, but you can integrate it with other systems. So, for example, it can be linked to, if we had the possibility here with the police service, as soon as an intruder goes in, you may not be there, but with the pressing of just a button, the police system will be alerted and they will be dispatched people from the station to go and catch the burglars. So that's where we're headed. And we need to start thinking. We need to start planning for this phase where we're going to be. Are we okay? Let's look at some of the possibilities for us in Ghana. So, for example, this company, Automation Ghana, is here. And they sell all sorts of appliances and all sorts of devices for home, for smart homes. Okay? You can look for them here in Ghana. I wanted to show us some of the possibilities that we have in Ghana. All right. I, I'll, I'll bring that up in a, in a minute. But let's also look at smart cities. Now, like smart homes, smart cities are cities where technology is leveraged to manage a number of things, from traffic control to waste management to even essential services. Imagine this. In Ghana, we all complain about Zoom Lion, right? Our bins get full and they never get picked up. 
okay but elsewhere there are things that are smart so it's not being picked on specific days the beans will be picked when the system tells the them that beans are full and need to be picked up where i live the beans get picked on saturdays so if i have a party and there's a lot of rubbish on wednesday it means the bin is going to be full and it's going to be overflowing all the way till sunday before the rubbish gets picked and if it rains there's spillage all over the place it's a mess we need to look forward to a day when we'll be running smart cities in Accra, where even just waste management is smart elsewhere as well you know in ghana we don't separate our rubbish let's be honest we don't separate our rubbish now elsewhere some of the trucks they bring to fetch the bins they've got cameras in them and so as you t as they tip the rubbish because the bins are tagged what happens is that they can identify those who have not separated your rubbish and you get fined because your bin is tagged are you okay so they can tell where they picked that from and then they'll send you a fine for you not separating your rubbish because we need to get to a point where we are managing our waste properly in Accra, Kumasi, and everywhere else. That's what we begin to look forward to, making Accra, Kumasi, and everywhere else greener. We can't call Accra a green city if we are not even separating our rubbish. Yeah? Now, this is a video from some cities, how they've embraced smart city technology and what it's helping them to do. Dubai and other places. Let's watch this video. Just how smart is your city? Chances are it's getting smarter by the year. Many governments around the globe are racing to infuse technology into just about every aspect of its city's operations. And I mean every part. Including public transportation, IT connectivity, water and power supply, sanitation and solid waste management, efficient urban mobility, e-governance, and citizen participation. And it does this using every buzzword imaginable, from big data to the Internet of Things. So how does a smart city work? Let's look at three examples. Here in Singapore, the city-state might be the gold standard of the most extensive effort to collect data on daily living. The government is now deploying systems that can tell when people are smoking in prohibited zones or littering from high-rise housing. Singapore launched its own Smart Nation program in 2014 and will add more cameras like these so the government can effectively monitor crowd density, cleanliness of public spaces, and even the exact movement of every locally registered vehicle. Much of the data it's collecting will be fed into an online platform called Virtual Singapore that gives the government access to how the city is functioning in real time. It could help the government predict how crowds might react to an explosion in a shopping mall or how infectious disease might spread. Over in Dubai, more than 50 smart services from 22 government entities have been rolled out as part of the government's Smart Dubai initiative. Using the government-provided app Dubai Now, you can do things like pay a speeding ticket, which likely captured you on a public camera and then emailed you the ticket directly. You can also use the same app to pay your electric bill, call a taxi, track a package you sent to your friend, find the nearest ATM, renew your vehicle registration, track the visa status of a relative, and report a violation to the Dubai police. Now head over to Barcelona, where one research firm estimates the city will save billions of dollars a year in energy costs just by installing smart systems like these. Number one, smart streetlights. Public lighting that adapts and dims when there's no activity but brightens up when sensors detect motion. The second, parking sensors. Instead of driving in circles looking for a spot to park, drivers can get real-time information on an app which locates free parking spots. Sensors on the street curb use lighting and metal detectors to know if a parking spot or loading area is occupied. And finally, garbage sensors, which are actually compact drop-off containers which have a vacuum network through pipes which sucks up trash below ground. The automated waste collection not only lowers noise pollution from garbage trucks, but also lowers costs and keeps bad odor away. Juniper Research estimates that by 2021, cities will save nearly $19 billion by making their cities smart. But of course, to save money, sometimes you have to spend it first. The global smart city market is estimated to attract $15 billion by 2021, and that's just for software. 
So now companies from Microsoft to Cisco are aiming for a piece of it. In Singapore, Upton Saidi, CNBC. All right. Still watching. So this is another level of it. Now, some of us might say, well, we're not there yet in Ghana. Or we don't make the decisions when it comes to planning the smart cities. But we're building communities, aren't we? And some of these communities we're building, we're doing street lighting, we're doing waste management and all those things. And we need to start embracing some of these for the uh, communities that we're building. Because we expect people to come and spend their money with us. And some of the people who have started buying properties here are experiencing these things elsewhere. And they expect to have the same kind of lifestyle when they move here. Are we okay? And we could also be the people that create a case study for the government to wake up and say, oh yes, this is how we need to start thinking about our cities. Is that okay? Now let's look at some of the options for Ghana. Traffic control. We all complain about traffic in Accra, don't we? But with a sm within a smart city, because there's so many cameras controlling the traffic, traffic can be diverted. So you could be on the N1 heading somewhere, and instantly you get an alert because you're on the app, like they showed with the Dubai app. You are alerted that no, there's this on this road. You need to divert, use this other road. Yes, we all use Google Maps, but it's, this can be smarter than what Google Maps gives you. Is that okay? Again, we can have crime and security. Now, one of the things that happened way back, some of us who've lived abroad, one of the reasons why, for example, when those of you who've lived in London, when in 2005, there was a bomb, underground bombing, one of the things that happened was that because there were so many cameras, they could track the people from when they left their homes, the buses they took, the tubes they jumped on, and they could track them and identify them and arrest them. That's what Smart City gives you. So, all this, I've had my car stolen from my home. To date, I've not heard anything about a car. But if we lived in a smart city, they could have tracked the car leaving from my home to wherever they want to dump my car. Okay, so that's possible. In fact, we've got cameras in places of Accra, parts of Accra, and the police have a control room where they're monitoring. The challenge is that it's not being scaled. And also, they are not using the data, they are not accessing the data, using the data to make decisions and to fight crime. And that's where we need to get to. We need to have a bigger conversation about this. And then also waste management, like I talked about. There's rubbish everywhere as you travel around Accra. But if the city was smart, rubbish wouldn't have to be picked on specific days. Rubbish would be picked when the bins are full. And that's what should happen. We would start separating our rubbish, and people will get fined for not separating their rubbish. So that we can do recycling properly. You just can't do recycling in Accra. Because it's one bin for everything. Glass, paper, food, everything. And we need to move away from that. The communities that we are investing in, we are building, we need to start implementing some of these solutions. So people will move to our communities who have a better experience. The guy even talked about smell in the video. When you have proper waste management, you don't get a stench you get in some of the communities when you move to them. It's sad to say it, but that's the reality here. Okay? Crowd control. When COVID hit, one of the biggest challenges was how to move people around. But with a smart city technology, what it means is that you can be able to tell when the crowds is building up and you start managing it, whether it's like police getting in there to intervene or whatever. So you manage the crowd properly. Then essential services. We have a problem in this town called no bed syndrome. Those of us who live in no, no bed syndrome. So sometimes you would drive from your home about 20 miles or about hours to get to a hospital and hotel there's no bed there. So the patient will die in the car. But if the city was smart and the hospitals were all connected, you could go into just an app and you'll be able to tell they'll be able to tell you where there's a free bed for you to take the patient. In the same way, we, have you all heard of Doomsaw? Those of you who are from you don't know Doomsaw. Doomsaw is just darkness. So nights when there are no lights. 
Now, what happens here in Accra and most parts of Ghana is that they are zoned. So, yes, East Ligon, today you are all off. Tomorrow, this other part is all off. But if we had a smart city, what it would mean is that the cities will be zoned. So, where there are residential areas that people leave the homes during the day, during the day, the lights can be off. But when they are home in the night, we can have lights. It's better than having a blanket arrangement, a blanket schedule where whether you are home or not, you could have light. And you don't have light when you really need the light. Okay? And street lighting and energy saving. You drive around town, we all complain there are no street lights. But that's partly because sometimes also, even during the day at 12 o'clock, the street lights will be on. We are not saving on energy. But some of these things can be automated. So that when it starts getting dark, the lights will come on. In the middle of the night, when there's no movement on some streets, the light doesn't have to be on. So we conserve energy. So these are some of the options that maybe we need to start considering. But the point I want to make here is that we, even we, as developers, don't need to wait till the government introduces these. We need to start thinking and implementing some of these in the communities we are building. Well, some of us are building communities with 100 homes, 200 homes, whatever. Even a security system at the gates before you enter the communities. These can be smart. So that once a person checks in at the gate, we can track their movement in the uh, community. Because people will tell you, I'm going to house number 16, and they end up going to another house and going to rob or do whatever. There. Are we good? So the options are there. The technology is there, like I said. We just need to embrace the right technology as solutions to some of the challenges that we have. Because the need is there. And for us as realtors, some of the people that we are targeting and selling to, they want these things. It's up to us to provide these. And in my business, I often say that where value is communicated and offered, price is not an issue. Okay, so let's look at some of the benefits. I've talked about some of them. Safer communities. Okay, energy saving, cost saving. When I say this, people don't understand it. The initial investment might be huge, but over time, it's cost saving. That was my tweet this morning. The initial investment might be huge, but over time, it's cost saving. Okay, effective decision making based on data. So you don't have to spend on some things. You learn by just looking at the data from the, from the systems. Improved urban transportation. We can't even have a proper bus system in this town because you cannot predict when the bus will get to the next stop. But with a smart city, all these will be on a network. So you can tell where the bus is and when it will reach your stop. Uber and the rest are doing it. So the technology is there. It should be possible. Yeah? Improved environment, like I said, waste management and greener cities. We can have them. Optimize essential services. So no time wasting our hospitals, for example. Hospitals can be connected. So when you book your hospital appointment, when you would know that, yes, the service can be there for you when you get there, and you get it on time, you can access the service. Okay? New business opportunities, because it's a whole industry, and if we embrace it, there will be new business opportunities for people, more jobs created for people. And I often say this, there are very, 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 very smart young men in this town, and women in this town. The only challenge is that they are not challenged to apply the technology in the right areas. So they are still doing basic stuff. And we need to have some of these conversations. Okay? I could go on and on. A reduction of both economic and natural input costs. Because the cost, like I said, initially might be huge. But over time, it pays off. There are challenges, though, I have to be honest. Now, every technology that's online means there's exposure. We know data. So you, you've heard stories of people hacking cameras. So people can target your home and hack your security cameras at home and view what they are not supposed to see. 
or blackmail you because they probably got some videos of you that are compromising whatever so that's there yeah it's still early so we don't want to have that conversation <laughs> but that's that, that that's possible or even your kids right they could tell what time the kids go to bed which rooms they are in all this all these armed robbers they are getting smarter and smarter so it means that once you're online that, that risk is there but you can't run away from it. You just have to make sure that you are taking the right steps so you can be secure. Because whether we like it or not, the benefits overweigh the challenges, okay? Like I said, significant initial capital. That might be the reason why people will not invest. But if you can find the money to invest in it, over time, it pays off. And there's dependence on technology. Sometimes the technology is not here. Let me be honest. The 4G we have here might not give you a great camera experience if you are using security cameras in your home. But we'll get there. That's the point. We will get there. Okay? Sometimes also, yes, there are smart people here, but they haven't learned enough about some of this technology. So we need to start encouraging people to learn some of these things so we can partner with them to be able to provide these services for us. And limited know-how. Okay? Even sometimes installing some of these becomes a challenge. But we'll get there. Yeah? So what are some of the trends to watch? Finally, this is not an industry that's just sitting there waiting. It's an industry that keeps evolving, that changes happening every day. What are some of the things to expect to see? More integration. So you will find that more devices and more appliances will be integrated. More communication, more communication from just one appliance. So with a mobile phone, for example, and with an app on your mobile phone, you can control other things in the home. You saw the Amazon Echo. Just that simple single gadget was controlling so much. So there's going to be a lot more integration. And there's going to be increased use of artificial intelligence. By that, what I mean is that because this, these appliances and this technology learns from our usage of the resources, it begins to work in a customized way. So the way it works for you might not be the same way it works for me. Because probably it learns that I leave home at 5 a.m. You leave home at 7 a.m. Okay? So it will learn when to turn the lights off. I don't need to tell it to turn the lights off anymore. Okay? And we'll begin to see the use of more touchless technology. This is something that happened. So you know during COVID, because all of us were encouraged not to touch things. So for example, if you get to a doorbell, okay, you don't need to press the doorbell anymore. Just by looking into the camera and the doorbell, it rings inside. So you didn't need to touch it. That's there. It's there today. Right? The same way you've seen these, what do you call it, um, sanitizer dispensers. You don't need to touch them. So there are going to be a lot more of these things, touchless gadgets coming out to manage our homes. And then smart coolers, for example. Okay, elsewhere, they have smart thermostats. So, for example, we know when to turn the heating on and when to turn it off. Here, too, we have smart coolers. So, for example, you don't have to sleep all night with your AC on. Right? It can tell when the room is chilled enough and turn it off. It can tell if you leave the AC on in the living room and go to bed. After a few minutes, when it knows this, it senses that there's nobody there, it will turn it off. And then even health tech. Because some of us too will overuse ACs and other appliances, so there's so much, sometimes so much uh, humidity, other things happening. But it will sense all of these. Okay? And some of them are even being built such that they will auto repair some of these challenges. So for example, if the vent needs to be cleaned, it will clean it. And a more high tech security ability. So, for example, I could be here, my home is in Westlands. If my kids get home and they need to get in, I can open the gate for them from here just by pressing on my phone. Are you okay? 
So that's where we're headed. Our smartphones are becoming a hub for controlling a lot of these things. Okay? Like I said earlier, play a siren when the intruder is around your house. Or turn on the light so they will think, ah, the guy has noticed us. That's why he's turned on the light. You are, you're not there. You just saw them on the, on, on, on the camera and you turn on the light just to ward them off. And we're going to have high-speed connection. There's 5G and the rest over. We expect that in Ghana, connectivity will improve, right? By a bit of the only slice on us, that when we develop some of our properties, we'll make sure that we lay the right cables and we provide the right connectivity for people to enjoy using some of these things, okay? And improved privacy features. Yes, I said that because it's connectivity and everything is online, we are exposed somehow. The developers will continue to improve some of the security features. So we'll have our privacy um, guaranteed. Thank you very much. Yeah. And that's me. Uh, I don't know if you want to take any questions while the panel gets ready. Any questions or anybody, anything you want to ask? Yes, sir. <laughs> You talked about security a lot when you did your presentation. <laughs> I can hear you, yes. All right, that's a good question. Now, we would need some of the industry players to have this conversation, okay? But for me, the important thing is that we as realtors, as an industry, are having this conversation. And we need to extend the conversation, have the conversation with the telcos, the network providers, t with the NCA, the National Communication Authority, which owns the licenses and all those things. Have these conversations with people like that. And also, even with the developer community, because we should get to a point where we have even our own applications and our own devices made here. Because they would understand our context a lot better. Yeah. So you're right. And for me, the plus is that we're having this conversation and we need to have more conversations around the table. But um, I have a lot of friends in the industry and that's how come I know some of these things are happening. But we need to, like, I, I've been telling Vicky, it's a great event. We need to bring more of these people around to have these conversations. Because it's like you said, it's here. And you said it. The embassy, when they're looking for property for their uh, staff, look for some of these things. Especially when it comes to security. And if we're going to attract the right business, we need to start providing some of these things. So we'll get the big money. Any more? Yes, please. Hello, you can hear me, right? Okay. Yes. Um, Nanette is filling in. One of my, the issues that I hear always come up is our loss of privacy in the advent of everything coming. Like, how do you address that, and how do we make sure there's a balance? All right. So, I often say this. Your security online starts with you. So one, making sure that you are on a secure platform. For example, if you're going to do these, don't use a public Wi-Fi. For example. Okay, that's number one. Number two, a lot of these things have passwords. Change them often. Don't share the security codes and things like that. So don't even, um, that's why even doorbells and gates opens have moved on from just giving codes to kids to one person controlling it from somewhere. If I have to open the gate for my kids, not only is it secure that I'm the only one that knows it, but also I can guarantee and be able to tell when the kids are home. So that's the second leg, okay? The third leg is that we need to start having more conversations and challenge the providers so they will make the platforms more secure. That kind of conversation that we're all having with Twitter and Facebook and the rest, challenging them that we know your system is not secure. And governments are going to have to call them 
to account. That's what we need to do. Unfortunately, we're not having enough of these conversations in this town. Okay. So I, I hope that helps. All right. You saw yesterday when I had to stand in for the MC and I was challenging the minister when he came that he, I would expect his people to be here to hear some of these things because if they don't hear it, they're the people who make big decisions and they need to be here to hear some of these things. Yeah. All right, any more, or can we have the panel session? All right, if there are no more questions or any comments, thank, thank you very you much. You. I yes, think, members. all right. I don't know, can I ask, can we move this away? So when we have the panel session, people can see the stage. We'll, we'll, we'll. So uh, before we start the panel discussion, uh, Madam Viti Zampa will do a short presentation, and then the other panelists will join. Madam Viti Zampa is the founder for GREPA, and also the chief executive Please, please a round of applause for her as she joins us now. Okay, so we shall see the video first, and then she'll join us. Grow. Information that's complete, accurate, and meaningful needs to be available in an instant. Disruption and the fragmentation of organized real estate are hot topics, especially when the consumer's focus shifts to technologies that are not industry-owned or controlled. The big question is, in the end, where will the consumer go for information? Will it be to the real estate boards, brokerages, and agents? Or will it be to a third-party company utilizing our data? At Realty Server, we believe, given the right tools, Organized real estate can and will win this online battle for the consumer's eyes. The new Exposure MLS platform has been built to take organized real estate to a new level of cooperation. Exposure is not just a multiple listing system, but a full content delivery platform designed to provide both the agent and the consumer with the best online search experience. Directly within the data entry process, professional photographers can be assigned to a new listing enabling them to upload their media and measurements directly to the MLS. The data entry process can then be completed and the listing submitted to the MLS. A unique website is automatically built specifically for each listing, displaying a variety of media and content designed to engage the consumer. For example, the property photos display in high resolution with no limit to how many photos can be uploaded. Floor plans are added and the photographer can make these interactive through the exposure system. Image hotspots can be created, as well as video clips and even panoramas. Virtual tours are also integrated into the platform, allowing consumers to virtually walk through the property. A property video can be uploaded, giving consumers a better understanding of the listings features. Additional content is automatically included to provide the consumer with the ultimate online experience, such as walk score, demographics, travel time, even the market trends can be included. When the consumer views comparable properties, a listing portal opens showing similar listings. And if the consumer wants to view even more listings, the option is there. When listings are being viewed, Notice how the system enables listing agents to share their media with all other agents. This high-level cooperation provides the consumer with a seamless and powerful search experience. If the consumer wants to automatically receive new listings from the agent, they can simply sign up by choosing their search area, selecting their criteria, and providing their name and email address. The agent can now activate this client, and a personalized website is automatically set up allowing this client to view all listings that fit their criteria, along with all additional media that has been added to each listing. Agents can now see what listings the clients are viewing, giving the agent more insight into the client's preferences. When viewing listings within an MLS search, agents can quickly see who listed the property and can view all media added. When sending listings to a client, agents can send out listing sheets, as well as the interactive MLS gateway allowing consumers to view listings in their preferred format. The client can print listings, get driving directions, and even send their favorite listings back to the agent. The agent's listing portal can also be included, 
giving the client access to all listings. The new CMA module makes comparing properties as easy as adding an address, choosing a price range, and selecting the search area. The listings are now organized and the numbers are calculated. The potential seller is now provided with an interactive CMA gateway that allows them to view these comparable listings in different formats and then see how these various listings compare to their property. Now they can view a complete summary of all the listings. Even the market trends are included for the subject property area and the entire board area. If the seller wants to view more listings, the listing portal can be included, giving them access to all listings across the region. Exposure also provides each agent with a free website called the Exposure Business Page, which includes the agent's personal listings, as well as their public portal for consumers. If the agent already has their own website, these tools can be integrated within, as shown in this example, as well as this example. Even brokerages can integrate the exposure tools within the brokerage website, providing consumers with a fantastic search experience. All brokerage listings display in the listing agent's template And all reciprocity listings display in the template of the agent assigned to floor duty, a great feature for agents looking to generate more business. Even the real estate board is provided with a listing portal that represents each agent and their individual listings. Again, all the media and additional content is in place, creating the best search experience available on the web and fully owned and controlled by each real estate association. The Exposure MLS platform will have a direct effect on the evolution of our industry as it fills the consumer demand for information that's complete, accurate, and meaningful. Thank you. I don't think I have to do a presentation. The video tells it all, right? Yeah. Okay, so in 2018, Grepa, the mic, Grepa introduced Exposure, with, which is the MLS that we have in Ghana here. Um, and I believe Ghana is the first country in the African continent that has an MLS. MLS is a multiple listing service. And it's a database. Unlike the online portals, this is a database that collects information and distributes information, also used for market analysis, um, investment reports, just for people to analyze the market's um, real estate data trend. So we invested in getting an MLS to Ghana in addition to uh, the rest of the initiatives that the organization has under their belt, including um, supporting legislation. The front facing, how do I control this thing? So the front facing is called, the front facing is the consumer facing and that's the uh, Loop Ghana. So with the MLS, we have the back office, which the agents use as, as, a, as their briefcase. And that is the exposure that the agents use. That's the agent's office. And then it actually gives the consumer a front-facing uh, portal, just like the online portals. If any of us know uh, Realtor.com, Tonatong, that's the front-facing. And that's what uh, the consumer will see. But behind the scenes, the agent will use exposure to top the house. We're talking about what kind of shingles is used to build the property, what kind of, um, whether it's a concrete building or it's a steel frame or whatever the building is made up of. These are some of the features that, detailed features that we need to put into the MLS. And it helps because people are able to, from all over the world, able in that property. The land size, room size. 
MLS is a marketing database created, maintained, and paid for by real estate professionals to help their clients buy and sell property. Access to the multiple listing service is provided to the public free control. Um, unlike other online portals that consumers will also go on there and pay for, you know, a fee for one property that they list, the MLS is not like that. The front facing of the MLS is controlled by the agent and the public cannot actually list there. This gives the agent the power of the market and um, because the consumer cannot go there and list publicly accessible includes information that would endanger seller's privacy or safety, such as seller's contact information. So when the agent inputs the property data into uh, the MLS, you have the option to also put in your seller's information or your landlord's information in the system. However, this information is not syndicated to the public, so it's protect your pu uh, public informa private information. I remember when the CEO of the Ghana Real Estate Agency Council was here yesterday, he talked about the fact that the government is creating a cloud-based system uh, enough to protect um, people's property information. And I think that's exactly what we have done so that our public info private information is not syndicated to the public. Okay, so accuracy information, MLS listing databases are considered to be the most accurate. As for property details on the internet elsewhere, uh, new listings might be entered within a specified time frame and with accurate data. And I think uh, GREPA is getting there with accurate data. We're, we're, we're building this um, as we move on. Uh, in, in advanced markets, information I would say is at least 80% accurate. Um, if you don't put accurate information in the system, you get fined. Uh, in Ghana, we haven't been able to get there yet, but we will get there one day. Um, from size of high level of accuracy, in the information. So that's one thing that we really want to stand by, transparency. And in talking about sustainability, I think uh, transparency is one key thing that we all have to encourage, especially in um, the kind of data that we feed to the world. Look Ghana MLS is an industry-built consumer-facing listing platform which is powered by Exposure. So Exposure is actually the brand that actually creates these MLSs. We are not the only country that actually uses Exposure. I know Jamaica uses it. They have about 20 or 30 different countries that are using this uh, platform by, Expo by Realty Server. Exposure, like I said before, Exposure puts the power back into the hands of the agent by providing a full featured website for every lesson. And I'll say one thing that in our MLS, one agent, you have only one property to one agent. We do not allow multiple properties, multiple agents less than one property. It's very common on the, the Ghanaian market to find several agents listing one property, different prices. And that's one key thing that we're trying to avoid MLSs does not allow multiple agents is to quickly and easily build their, all the uh, print materials. It also allows you to print your flyers to share on social media. The Exposure app enables industry service providers to publish content to the system. Exposure has been designed to strengthen organized real estate by filling the consumer demand for digital content. Uh, the video we just played. And I just mentioned also that Look Ghana MLS is a public facing site. So if as a consumer you want to see how our system works, um, the website is Look Ghana MLS. And this is how it looks like um, online. If you Google Look Ghana MLS, you'll see uh, this, this uh, presentation is a little old, so you don't see as many properties that's dotted on the screen. But um, we do have a lot of listings currently. So that's the website, lookganamls.com. The good thing about this is that we do syndicate to international markets. Um, we have, through the RELTA affiliation we have, we have um, a bilateral agreement with the National Association of Realtors. And because of that, we enjoy the services 
of our properties also syndicate into Realtor.com. I think most of us know about Realtor.com. It's um, the world's largest um, online marketing portal for properties. So an and MLS that syndicate to Realtor.com also get the privilege to have their properties show in other countries. We do have 18, no, sorry, eight other countries that receive our listings on their portals. Data is the new gold. Technology ch technological change affects everyone. It alters our daily lives at every level, social, economic, and political. And I think Nasser gave us a beautiful presentation um, when he talked about smart cities. He's a tech guy, so um, you guys should follow him a lot. He's always talking about technology. Okay, so just to reiterate that, the world we live in today is a digital one, and searching for a home is not different. Buyers now have apps that allow them to search by location and neighborhood. Online listings have virtual tours to view, so viewers can look at potential homes whilst narrowing down the search to select few in the effort to save time. Online searching maximizes the ability to compare and contrast homes on the market by selected features. Most of this is done before a potential home buyer connects with the agent. So like I said, it's very important for you to put accurate data, beautiful pictures, well-staged homes, so you can attract the consumer. This is just um, you know, data on um, how many people are going online looking for properties. Again, same thing, the use of internet to search homes um, by age. Same thing, uh, this is a person's internet usage decreases with age. The preferred method of communication with clients, email, telephone, and instant messages. Nobody, else, nobody uses postal mails anymore, right? Okay. It's relative and te telecommunication, sorry. Okay. Predictions. New technology signifies significantly affect the real estate industry. Robots, drones, and sensors replace many operational activities in real estate. The relationship between people and technology gain increasing, increasingly sensitivity. <laughs> new technology continues to attract new players to the market, and real estate service providers consider integrating technology among their services so they become harder to replace. And that's the multiple listing service. You cannot um, replace it or you cannot duplicate it. Smart buildings are emerging. Has real estate become digital? Yes or no? No answers? Okay, so it's saying that real estate agents now use internet, phone for every asset aspect of your business operations. Telecommunications infrastructure in building network based on cities, towns, neighborhoods, as well as um, international. Telecommunications infrastructure is dictating where people want to relocate. As technology becomes more integrated, mobile devices and modern infrastructure is a requirement and will, have, will pave the way to work from nearly anywhere in the future. As population increases, the need to economize space, including shared works, workplaces, has also increased, and thus mobile technology has made this possible. Big data determines the industry future between technology and increasing requirements of users and owners. Personal and building data will accumulate on a large scale. So. Those who can use data in a profitable way will be positioned for future success. This is just the benefits of partnering with MLS. I was just making another presentation for a company, so. The opportunity cost of underserved markets and spaces and unfulfilled demand is a risk that has to be avoided. ITIL, risk management. Many of us 
has taken the ITIL certification. This was a quote in that program. I think that's about it. That ends my present presentation. <laughs> I think we'll get the panel together and then if you have questions on the MLS, I'll take that whilst we're still here. All right, so we join, we invite um, Nasa to join the panel again, and then we see you in this one. Um, COD Realty, please join the panel. Thank you very much. Please, a round of applause for them. Can we have a second microphone, please? A second microphone. All right, so um, I'll start with um, Nase first. Uh, you give it a start, you are the tech guy. But we look at the figures we have. Ghana's internet penetration is about 53%. Let me add literacy rate to it. Literacy is about 70%. Is that no problem enough to st start worrying about smart cities and smart buildings and smart homes? Uh, let me ask you a question. <laughs> when was the last time you went to an internet cafe? 2000. Do you know what we call internet cafe? <laughs> <laughs> we yeah. don't go there anymore, do we? Do, yes. Yeah. Because we can access the internet from wherever we are. Number two, don't you get videos from your grandma in the village? We do. All the WhatsApp videos. Of all these strange preachers and stuff. <laughs> Right? So the penetration is huge. You just need to provide technology that they can assess at their level. Okay. Now, I'll give you an example. I have a client, very rich. Okay. He asked me, Nase, can I watch, he's got properties all over. Can people watch my properties as you do a virtual tour here? I said, we haven't implemented the technology here yet. He said, you know why? My son in New York, he was going to rent a place. He sent me a link to watch the video so I could see where I was going to live so he could pay, I could pay for it. And he's asking, why haven't we brought the technology here? He doesn't understand what goes on inside the phone, but he, has, he understands the functionality. The functionality yeah. yeah, so we better have this conversation. This conversation is late. Just to, I, just I, to I, add to what Nase just said, and maybe to uh, make a point of correction, we do have virtual uh, tours in Ghana, and yeah. um, Desmond, Desmond here will be um, a good person to talk about that. Uh, the other thing is our MLS does have um, a spot for virtual tours. If you list your properties on the MLS, there's a portion that you can upload your virtual tour, and people can actually see the virtual tour of the home. Because we syndicate to the realtor.com, we should have all these features available because it's a requirement. Right, um, speaking of virtual tour, I'll come to you this morning. And again, this question is for you and madam. Um, we have a market that is still getting regulated, people appreciating the work of agents and brokers. Now, I'm actually dealing with a situation where right now, where we've taken a client to go and see a house. <coughs> also, on a, you heard his hand, took him there, you saw the house. The next minute to realize he's talking to the, the landlord, landlord directly and paying money. And you're cut out from your commission, right? Now this is when you have really actually walked them there. <coughs> now you're going to introduce virt virtual tours. <coughs> you can actually sit anywhere, look at the building, and we are in the um, information world, technology is everywhere. You can actually Google and use the GPS address and locate the landlord. Are we not bringing trouble to ourselves? Are we not making, gonna make our work difficult and end up losing money? Technology is good, but are we not going to make our work more difficult with all the virtual tours and having to do sort of not in-person 
um, conversations and meetings? Um, so for me, I, I think that there are two processes um, that, that you want to take notes of. For example, before you take a client to any property or before you give them a link to any property, you might as well have sent the developer or the individual owner an email introducing the details of the clients already to the, the, the owner of the property or to the development company, telling them, hi, so my name is this, introduce your company and the name of the clients and the company and even their, their, their email and mobile um, details so that you've put that in an email thread already and so officially you are the agent or the broker that has introduced them. Sec the second way you can attack it is that um, once you've built a portfolio that people seem to trust your brand, then you can sign on exclusivities. And so you have exclusive rights of listing that particular property. And so any deal that comes in per way of tenants or sale or buyer buying the property, you're still entitled to a certain part of that, that, that um, sale that has been done. Um, I just wanted to add a few to smart homes. I always say we should think globally. We should think beyond just the four corners of our country because whether we like it or not, that is where the world is moving towards. And even currently, a lot of developers are looking for um, the green certifications. And one of the standards that you're required to get your green certification is when you move into what uh, Nase spoke about, when you have more of the smart implication, uh, implementations in your building and you can reduce the, the use of this energies in your property. And so for me, it's, it's better we understand that it will take time for the NCA and all the mobile networks to bring the 5G and the fast internet. But once we understand the system and how the system works, when they're ready and they plug us in, we already have the required knowledge. And I'll touch on the uh, part of the uh, listing the property and GPS locations and the, <clears throat> clients going the clients going to find the owner and all that. I think with time, as we take control of the MLS, the fact that the, uh, the client will not be able to list on the portal, we take control. And you heard when I did the presentation that the MLS puts power in the agent's hands. So with time, if everybody agrees to use the MLS, we have our briefcase we have the back office, that's where we have our data. And nobody else except agents are able to go back there. So that gives us the control of the market. We don't want to monopolize the market, but we want control. This is our profession. This is what we do. Can you go into the attorney general's office or the courts and find details of a case that you don't have access to? You cannot. So we need to protect our industry. The more we all agree to use the MLS, the more we protect our market. Once we do that, people will stop going behind because you are the agent. And I also talked about the fact that one agent to a property. So if you listed the property and Francis goes behind you, you know very well, and everybody knows that the listing is for Francis. My so there's was. no way that they will go behind you. It's, 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 it's <clears throat> something that we all have to do together, okay? and it takes time. It will not be today, but it's, it's an effort that all of us will have to agree to do it, and with time, things will change. Rome was not built in a day. So we have to do this, you know, thinking that in future it will work. Let, let, let me just add this, see, and let's be honest, as a marketing professional, I often say this, you can't win by trying to restrict the market mm. or the customers, whatever. You can only win by offering value. So even the property owner, he's not going to go behind you if he appreciates the value that exactly. you offer him. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And that's what you should focus on. Not stopping him from getting access to the tenant or, or a competitor. No. Right. You offer great service and let the service speak for itself and he will come for you. And uh, also to add to that, I'm glad you brought that up as the value that you're proposing to your clients. Um, I had a listing some months ago, and every week I was giving my clients, and I think I talked about that the other day when we were having a CIPS class. Yes. What I was doing was every week I was giving my client updates. <clears throat> and the updates I was giving to my client 
was Jared from the MLS. I'm able to show him the data, the statistics, that people are looking at the properties. People are actually looking on their phones. They are looking from Canada. They are looking from US, and it's all in the MLS. And that's why I keep con convincing you guys to use the MLS. I was able to do that for a period of about three months. Then after that, somebody else bought the property. I think it was a family friend or something like that. He still paid me because he saw the value, just like Nasser said, the value that I gave him. So he, he still paid me, and I had an exclusive. So that's one other thing that you have to do. You try and get exclusive agreements with your sellers. I see Maurice wants to ask something. Now, as we tackle it, please add this. Can we trust our clients? You've been doing virtual, or you are in a market that's a bit more open and used to this. And now you've come here, we've had classes, we've had interactions, we've shared some of the experiences with you. But can we trust our clients? Can we trust our buyers? Can we trust those ones who remind that they won't go behind us and this will actually enable to our benefit eventually? So, <coughs> thank you for asking that question. Um, I want to start off by saying that I'm going to answer your question with a question. <laughs> Can our clients trust us? Mm. Way too often, we think that our only job is to put the property in the MLS or online, we get the deal, and it's done. And then we wonder why our clients run away from us. We wonder why they go somewhere else. You have to set the expectation and set the stage from the very beginning. When our clients look at marketing, when I go through the listed properties on the MLS, I see pay people taking pictures with their cell phones mm -hmm. and not a cell phone that was made in the last decade. Um, you can barely see anything and it looks sloppy. We're marketing professionals. That is a small piece of the pie of what we do. We also are transaction facilitators in charge with protecting the investment and the assets of our clients. And so why would I stay loyal to somebody if I don't hear from them after I sign a listing agreement or after I give them permission to sell my home? To Vicki's point, we marketed your home on these 15 websites. From each of these websites, we had 15 views. Views came between 11 p.m. and 6 a.m. Predominant views came from the United States. In the United States, those views came from California. California, the demographic within this local market is this. And we see a lot of transit trends from that particular market into our market during these times of the year. And so if we're going to sell this property for the highest and best value, we're going to need to sell it to likely that market, and we're likely going to wait until that period of time. Now, that doesn't mean that something won't happen in between, but we know our market. We know what to expect. You know what somebody is going to pay. You know what somebody is going to say about the property, about the flaws, about the benefits. And how do you position that for success? Technology today allows us to do that so easily. And in our industry here in Ghana, we're fighting ourselves all day, every day, for work that should be exclusive. If you go to an attorney, nine times out of ten, people don't know who that attorney is before they meet them. They don't know how good of a job they're doing or bad of a job they're doing. But that attorney's assistant updates them once a week via phone, via email, via text message, however that client wants to be touched. And so what I ask and what I request from our industry is that we see ourselves more than glorified or order takers. <laughs> our job is not to ride around and just pick up listings and hope one of them sells. It's to effectively communicate the value of that piece of real estate, again, to achieve the highest possible return on that investment, not just for the sellers, but also for the buyers. I like that. And I think just to bring it back to what we were talking about, and this is what technology enables you to be able to do. Mm -hmm. One thing that 
Morris talked about. I often say to my clients that build a good photo library. People approach you, they want to sell your property, you ask for pictures, and they send you, they send you pictures that you can't even appreciate what the room looks like. There are no details. So when you get a new listing, take some time, visit the invest in even lighting. I know we may not be able to afford professional photography at this stage, but learn, oh, let's go, we all have smartphones. So learn to take the right pictures. Invest in light bulbs and screw the light bulbs into the sockets where they don't exist. That yeah. will help tremendously with light. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So that's good advice for all of us. And, and um, also staging. <laughs> you have to stage the property. I yes. see so many pictures um, online that has bed sheets that beds not laid. I oh. know, uh, right? Let, let, and let, if you let, go let to the this one. kitchen. Because, because it's my industry. Let me see this. See, a room with four walls. Yes. Yes. Because the guy has no time to do it. And I'm like, you're selling 15 homes. Why can't you just turn one of the homes into a showroom for the time being? Right. People who build, the developers, mm -hmm. uh, them to educate them about how important staging and all. So that's why for most of our properties you see, there's yeah, unfurnished. Not appealing, yeah. yeah, it's and, and, and to add to the pictures and all that, I think uh, not just staging the home, but a good curb appeal. Yeah. You know, your pictures should be inviting. The way you even take the pictures, where you stand, how yeah. high you go, how to position your cameras. Yeah. You don't have to invest in a very expensive. Not just when you take pictures. When you show up to the house, you shouldn't show up late behind.